Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Live Ultralight podcast. Today, we have a very special guest who has set an FKT in his past. He actually has two of them, although we spent most of our time today talking about the one on the John Muir Trail. Obviously, if you haven't heard of John Muir Trail, uh, you better crawl out from underneath the rock or not. Just look it up. It's one of the most famous and iconic trails, um, I'd say, here in America. And our speaker has actually set the FKT on that. So let me introduce him and let you know a little bit about his background before we roll this podcast. Um, It was a fantastic, fantastic podcast. So I'm really excited that you're here. But if you are new to this podcast, this is the Live Ultralight podcast. It is powered by Outer Vitals. And our goal with this podcast is to inspire you Um, to have more confidence, to be more lightweight, more capable so that you can go and live a life full of adventure. Um, I've recently been able to go and do a little bit of exploring, I guess you could per se, in uh, Germany and Austria. And it really, I'm going to have to do a podcast on it because it was a phenomenal trip and I'd love to share some of the experiences there. But really this concept of lightening up your, your backpack, developing more confidence in your gear, um, played a big role in that. We, I, I was able to travel for nine days out of a single backpack, have a phenomenal time, stay extremely comfortable, and just feel very inspired to do that. So if that resonates with you, make sure that you subscribe to this podcast. All right, so let me go ahead and introduce our guest for today. Aurelien Sanchez is a French runner and backpacker who holds the record for the self-supported fastest known time for the South to North route on the John Muir Trail. In fact, he's helped the record for this trail, uh, for the self-supported version of this uh, from 2018 all the way until this year, 2022, um, which is absolutely incredible. In fact, if you look him up today, you'll st- still see that he holds the record from south to north, although it's been beaten from north to south now. Um, it took him three attempts, which is really interesting part that we unpack here in, in the podcast. But when he did complete it on that third attempt, he completed it in three days, three hours, and 55 minutes. Aurelian is kind of an enigma. He's not as well known out there. Uh, maybe it's because he's he's got that French background, um, but I'm not totally sure. You'll only be able to find him um, through his YouTube channel where you can go and watch a video of these efforts or uh, through his Instagram account. So I do encourage you to go look him up there. But it was very, very fun to unpack what makes him tick, what pushed him to go and complete this trail. It was very interesting from um, tales of hallucinations to unpacking why it took three attempts and what he learned from those different attempts um, and what he's doing next, which is also something of very uh, I find very, very interesting. Hopefully one day we'll be able to even have him back on the podcast to hopefully talk about his end goal of competing in that race. So Without further ado, I'll go ahead and roll the podcast right here. I hope you guys enjoy it. I definitely did. And uh, we'll catch on the other side of it. All right, Aurelian, I'm super excited to have you on here. And I figured I'd just start off by asking a little bit of your background uh, before we get into the actual FKT attempts, multiple attempts mm-hmm. from what I understand yeah. and, and yeah. diving into that. But would really love to know a little bit more about you. I, I believe you're you're an ultra runner. Have you always been a runner? Not really, actually. Uh, when I started this FKT, the John Muir, I was uh, just a soccer player uh, in France originally, the, where I moved to the US for work. And in the US, I became more a hiker because I wanted to, to see the area. I wanted to visit Arizona and Utah, actually. So, um, so I became more of a hiker. But yeah, in, when I was playing soccer with my friends, of course, I was running, but I was not doing the actual running, as we know, uh, and the actual ultra running. Not really. That was not really my background. So um, I always liked sports. Uh, but then I, this is when I moved to the US in 2016, where I started to enjoy really hiking, uh, mostly in the Grand Canyon, actually. Yeah, I would say that you've always been a runner than uh, playing soccer. You know, I had to stop playing yeah, soccer. Yeah, exactly. With, with the board. Runner with the board. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I stopped playing soccer at like age seven or eight because I got too many side uh-huh. aches. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> I was not a, I was not ever a runner as a kid. So, um, yeah. and I mean, I'm sure you were playing uh, high level and 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 uh, those are big fields, right? I mean, you're running a lot. So. Uh, not, not that high, but yeah, I was uh, running a lot uh, within my team and running as fast as I could. So I was really running all over the field, and that was my strength, let's say. But otherwise, in terms of level, I was not that uh, technique, so <laughs> yeah. it was not that great. I, I was not able to make that of, uh, as my job <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Were you playing more as a striker or defender, midfielder? Yeah, I was more a striker on the on the ale. uh, So you're trying to. So you're a sprinter, huh? 
Exactly. I was, I was. Now I'm uh, a slow, I'm not a sprinter anymore. Now. <laughs> if you're running, you know, you have to slow down. So it's a totally different thing. I know. It's, it's kind of funny sometimes when you talk to people about like the speeds of ultra runners, right? You're like, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was talking to someone uh, about, um, no, someone else is telling me this story. They're talking about how fast Killian Jornet, you know, ran the Hard Rock mm-hmm. 100. Mm-hmm. And this guy on an airplane was like, that's only like four miles an hour. I think I could do that, you know? <laughs> it's yeah, like yeah, you yeah. have no idea what you're talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah. It's a different, <laughs> uh, different thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so you moved to the U.S., you're working here, and you just start exploring. Were you getting into backpacking, or when did you learn about FKTs? So um, I was not really into the backpacking. I was only doing a day hike, let's say, uh, in the Saturday. And I'm do- I was doing something else on the, on the Sunday. Um, and the FKT was um, after two or three years uh, where I actually, when I started do- to do longer hikes, uh, I didn't have much vacation uh, to take because I was spending some of my vacation to go back to France. So I was starting to, to do bigger hikes within one day uh, to see beautiful places that I could not see if I didn't spend three, four, five days backpacking. So I was doing that only within one or two days maximum. And then I started to build a lot of uh, endurance by doing that without training much. And uh, at some point, I was like, it would be interesting to see what would be your limits if you really give you a, a big a big challenge. And if you train for it, and I was uh, I was curious. I was like, uh, what could you do? And um, and at this time, I was looking online at uh, different things, and I saw the the Barclay Marathon. I don't know if you know the the race. Yes. Uh, in yeah, yeah. And uh, and when I saw it, I it was uh, I, I, or I it's kind of uh, I fell in love with it. It was really the the event and the race um, I wanted to do because this is really the race where you push your limits. You know you're gonna fail, but you know how far you're gonna go. And that's really what I wanted to do. And by seeing that, then I was trying to chase who did it, how they entered it. And I saw Brett Mowney, uh, which is a record holder of the of the Barclay, who did uh, before the Barclay the John Muir Trail. He was a record holder. He, he was a ZFKT um, holder of the John Muir. And I thought that would be amazing if you can get the, the John Muir Trail FKT. Maybe that will get you enter into, uh, into the Barclay. So. Um, that's the first step. I wanted to get a big challenge and then I decided, okay, this is maybe the way I can enter uh, this event and let's do it. And uh, it was painful. <laughs> I didn't succeed at the first time because I didn't do any ultra running at the time, but uh, that's oh, how right. I got into the FKT. Yeah. Wow. Did you ever, did you ever uh, get to attempt the Barkley marathon? So it's been five years. Uh, I'm trying to apply to get into okay. the race. Uh, it's been not successful until uh, since that, since 2017. And it seems that, that my luck is turning uh, good right now for next year. So, uh, really? Yeah, it's some, something uh, usually we don't communicate much, but maybe something is going to happen next year. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, that'd be really interesting. Uh, if I might have to have, bring you back on after you run that because that is a crazy race. If, if, if any of the listeners have not heard of the Barkley Marathon, you should definitely go look it up. It's, it's, I don't know how to describe it other than it's just a, a bizarre, yeah. um, it's a it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's basically a race, right. Where you're, you're pushing your physical limits, but you also have to keep your, your head and your whereabouts. You have to navigate, mm. um, you know, all sorts of different things there, which, which I think is a lot harder to do than people realize, right. When you're, when you're out right. on these big efforts, your mental and cognitive abilities really start to, to diminish. And, and some people have never set foot off of a, uh, established trail too. Right. So yeah. Um, there's a, there's definitely a lot of interesting and, and very hard aspects of that race, which is, it is, it's an anomaly. It's a really, really cool race. So, yeah, um, exactly. I, th- I find that really interesting that you talked about, like what initially drove you was just trying to cover more miles so that you could see more in the, in the limited window that you have. I really resonate with that personally. Um, in fact, what got me into trail racing to begin with was this concept called fast packing. Have you ever heard of fast packing? Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, same thing, you know, I have a business to run, I have a family, I have little kids. And so it's like, you, you've got limited amounts of time and, and you start to do all of, all of the hikes, at least around me, you know, that are, that are shorter. And you start to look at, at the ones that are more challenging, more big. And, um, Mm -hmm. if you can cover them faster, right. Then 
there's just it opens up more and more opportunities. So um, I definitely resonated with re- resonate with that, and uh, mm-hmm. it's honestly kind of the same way that I got into just trail trail running, and then. I mean, I guess I entered a race, but I was not racing <laughs> by any means. <laughs> um, so that, you, you, race, you race against the clock, you race against yourself. In any case, you don't get, you don't race against the other runners, but that's not the most important, I think, in ultra running. And that's why every people are, are likes to do that because also, also there is a lot of uh, companionship uh, within that. We all fight uh, together uh, against ourselves, which is good. And uh, yeah, you, you race against yourself and against the, the race, so that's good. Yeah, yeah, it was it was fun. It was challenging and and mm. a little bit addicting too, right? Um, there's definitely something there. I think I don't know. I, I mean, maybe you could weigh in on this too, but I wonder if you know, coming from like a sports background, if there's something about the FKTs or or any of that that like kind of calls to us right like in that competitive nature of, of some way but um i think i think i like to compete and even if it's competing against myself i find that that interesting what i like about the fk team beyond the fact the, the competitiveness let's say it's uh it's people showing how this is possible to do this in some time when i saw when i saw the video from andrew benz which was the original uh, fkt order of the John Muir, it was so inspiring. When I watched the video 20, 30 times, I don't remember how many, but I was like, this is so inspiring. How is it possible to do this, uh, this trail within uh, three days and 11 hours? It was for him. Uh, and I watched it again and I was trying to understand how this is possible with all the hallucination behind. And it was not something I was able to understand. And I wanted to leave that for myself. And I, want to, I wanted to get this uh, reference and say, okay, if he did it and if uh, he trained for that, maybe I could do it also. It was some kind of inspiration and asking myself, okay, maybe now can you put the limit a little bit better for someone else as well? And this is how I see the FKT, more about inspiration instead of just saying, hey, okay, Andrew, see, I did uh, five hours faster than you. It's not the point, I think. Yeah. It is super inspiring to see what people are capable of. And I mean, it's... I feel like the last, say, five years or so, it's been absolutely remarkable. People just keep pushing it so much yeah. harder, and it's becoming a bigger and bigger thing for sure. Yeah. Um, when you went to do this for your first attempt, what year was that? It was 2017. It was one year before I uh, succeeded. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so you had two attempts on it then? I had three. Uh, the, <laughs> the second one was kind of curious because it was only seven days before the, the third one, yeah. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you, did you, you said you did no training for the very first attempt? Oh, no, no, no. I did a lot of training. Uh, okay. Oh no. I spent all my summer doing long hikes, doing uh, training runs. Uh, but before that, I never had any race. I never ran a marathon. I never ran any ultra marathon. I just did long hikes by myself, long repeats in the Grand Canyon, going up and down. And yeah, this was a big training, um, but something I discovered at the end that was not sufficient. Uh, I was not ready. And uh, yeah, lack of experience and you learn about it and you move forward. And uh, but yeah, uh, no, I spent some training time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you you made it a long ways into that first effort, right? I mean, you were, I mean, how, how many miles did you, did you even, did you complete it? Just not, just not set the record or did you come off trail? No. Yeah, I went off trail. Um, so the thing is, um, I, I, I did a lot of mistakes. Uh, I was never able to. Uh, I was never able to get the, the FKT at this time because of lack of experience. Uh, the, the food I brought with me, I was not able to eat because I never tried. Uh, the headlamp without uh, much battery because I didn't have any uh, any battery left. Uh, the recovery that I was not handling properly before getting to sleep. I was not eating or drinking. So when I was moving uh, from my nap. I was uh, I was dead. I was not recovered because you need to drink and eat before taking a nap so that the body can recover. So many mistakes that made that I was not able to finish uh, within time. So I decided to quit after it was about 150 miles instead of 220. Uh, so I did some long way. I did about 60 hours on the trail, but uh, far from my uh, from my goal at least. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's really interesting, and I think that that's also. Um, just so true, right? That you have to prove out all these things. And, and really, mm-hmm. the, I think the most interesting part of when you push your limits is a lot of times you think that you have done the proper preparation. 
Yeah, uh, for yeah. me at least, it seems like anytime I'm pushing my limits on either backpacking trip or um, trail running, it it uncovers the areas where you you know like until you push that hard, you don't know that this can become a weakness exactly. per se, right? Exactly, and I think that's the beauty of ultra running because this is uh, exactly what you say. You just try to put your strengths everywhere. You 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 make your focus. You make your training. You train your nutrition, your sleep, etc. But at some point, you will face whatever you didn't have, you, you didn't prepare, whatever uh, weakness you have, you will see it, and that will make you a better person eventually if you can uh, identify the weakness and if you can train uh, out of it. And that's the beauty of it, and that's why I like ultra running because at the end not even talking about sport it can make you a better person more humble i would say also because you know your weakness and you know for some of them how to address them or not and really that show you that shows you uh, that you're not the strongest people uh, ever and that you have to face your weakness otherwise you you don't succeed and uh, and that's something i like yeah yeah had you done training to run through the night no, never. Um, I had some difficulty uh, when I did my John Muir about that, but the mental strength and the mental focus and the, the will of doing it made that I was able to, to go strong and to go without sleep in the night. So I didn't feel really the need of training. Uh, my training mostly was mental uh, visualization, visualizing, uh, visualizing that the night would be long, that it would be hard, but that my goal was to finish within time so that when I was uh, having a hard time in the night, I was still moving. Uh, but I didn't train any, any specific, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's interesting. The John Muir, like the distance of the John Muir is one, I guess it kind of keeps moving, but like, I would say that historically that was kind of like the biggest distance that people would go without, um, really like sleeping, right? Like you, you took naps, right? Mm, yeah. But, um, like in the, in the trail running world now, there's, there's people that are starting to push these limits without, necessarily even sleeping, right? Like two to three day pushes with no sleep. And I think the John Muir, as far as long trails is probably one of the only ones in that FKT world right now that Mm -hmm. like, it's long enough that you should sleep, but people are like, no, you've got to push harder. And so they're not sleeping on the trail. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, I remember when I did it, um, I was uh, I was making the the time better than Andrew, Andrew Benz at, at, at the time. And Andrew slept about 10 hours on the trail. Um, so, and I, sp- I slept only about two hours. So I did a big step uh, about that. And I did it on purpose because I was really feeling that I was not stronger than Andrew. I was, uh, Andrew was really impressive for me and, and sp- uh, a good inspiration for me. So I was like, if you want to go faster than Andrew, you have to sleep less. Uh, and this is how you can just uh, go to the finish faster but i was f- thinking my pace would be slower than him so this is and i remember when i saw andrew uh, talking about uh, beating the fkt he said wow only two hours of sleep and i thought yeah this is uh, getting tighter and tighter now and i saw the the, the last people uh, joe mcconaughey and um, and uh, i don't remember matt um, i don't remember the name of the current fkt holder they di- they didn't sleep much <laughs> yeah yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine um, going that long without sleep. I, I don't know that I've ever done that honestly in my life until you have like a big, big goal like this. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, like going back to just this very first attempt. So your biggest takeaways from this first attempt were that you need to dial in your food a little bit better, maybe dial mm-hmm. in your gear, your gear a little bit better. Yeah. Is there anything else that that stood out? So on my gear, for example, um, I didn't take any mattress, any tent, anything. I just took, um, uh, how to say, um, for a security sleeping bag, a uh, thing uh, where you get a uh, cord, you know. Uh, and I was like thinking a reflective. About... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't, re- I don't remember the emergency. name. Emergency. Uh, they call it. Yeah. They usually they call it like emergency blanket or. Exactly. Exactly. I took this emergency blanket. I was and I was thinking it would isolate me from the floor, you know. <laughs> and the floor was freezing at night. So I was sleeping on that, but I was feeling cold. <laughs> and yeah. then I got inside it. And then because it's, you cannot breathe within it, uh, my uh, my sweat was uh, making me even colder. So I was yeah. not able to sleep uh, because of that. Uh, so I had to keep moving. 
So I was not able to sleep. Uh, my headlamp was not best. Yeah, the equipment was not really right. And uh, and I think also my training was not right uh, because I was the first time I was training for something like this. And I learned in the end that um, I didn't uh, do enough. Yeah. Okay, so what did you change in training for the next year? I brought up the elevation gain per week. Uh, I did even more tra training runs longer uh, than I did the, the year before. Um, and then I, I spent a lot, uh, a lot of time trying my nutrition, trying my food uh, that I was able to eat. Uh, I took cliff bars the first year that I was not able to eat. I didn't take them uh, the year after. I took uh, almonds, I took uh, sweets, I took bacon. I took a lot of foods that I really was able to eat. And bacon was actually the, the most important one. <laughs> yeah, I, I think bacon would be great on trail. <laughs> uh, that was nice. Bacon jerky, it was uh, especially. Uh, but it was very nice, yeah. So, uh, so do you, you talked about like increasing your mileage and your elevation. Were you, um, were you just training overall more time? Or were you kind of making it more like, like you're doing bigger long runs and just trying to get more elevation there? So um, my biggest training run, which was a funny one, actually, it was the Bright Angel and South Sky Bab Trail in Grand Canyon. I don't know if you know about those. They're kind of um, classic. Yeah, we, we ran rim to rim to rim uh, oh. in May. So it was so we, we oh. went on both of those, actually. We came down South Sky Bab, and then on the, okay. after we're coming back, we went up Bright Angel. Ah, very nice, very nice. So I did that as a training, rim to rim to rim, uh, sometimes. Uh, but my biggest training was to do that three times, uh, Bright Angel South Sky Bab, uh, to, to, to go down to the Colorado three times in a day and twice wow. the day after. So I was doing that five times in the weekend. And it was funny because <laughs> at some point I was seeing the same people five times because there were people going down, spending the night and going up the day after. <laughs> so it was so funny. I was seeing the people five times while on their side, for, for some of them at least, doing it uh, by the weekend, they were very proud of it. So they could not understand why I was doing that five times. So it was funny to, to see that. And those were my um, my biggest training runs. It was about 150 kilometers and um, I don't know the elevation. I think it was about 6,000 meter, yeah, 20,000 feet, something like that in the weekend. Yeah, I want to so, say it's about 4,000 feet out. So 20,000 sounds right. Yeah, yeah, that was something like that yeah, in the weekend. So, and that was uh, the end of my training, let's say. Then I took two weeks of, uh, of rest, uh, let's say. Uh, and that's what I did for my second attempt of the John Muir, where I, uh, I failed again. And that's actually my second attempt also, which helps like a training for my third attempt, which happened um, one week after. How, so how long was your second attempt? I, like, was it a big effort or did you start and just stop really quickly it was a very big effort uh, it was um <laughs> you i was yeah 190 miles i was about oh 30 my. miles from the finish and what happened actually is that i was i knew I, at least i believed that i would get the fkt at this time and uh, by lack of experience i lost my lucidity um and the third night of not sleeping I was star starting to face hallucination uh the trees and the rocks talking to me and things and they made my uh, they made me lose my mind. Uh, I was not eating and drinking anymore. I was uh, not behaving as an ultra runner should behave when there is still 15 and 20 hours remaining. I was about six hours ahead of my pace, but I lost it within the last 15 hours um, because of overconfidence uh, and loss of uh, lucidity. Uh, but my training was there. Uh, I was uh, I was feeling strong at least. I was feeling that I was able to do it. And uh, and strangely, after that, I recovered very fast uh, because I was eating and uh, drinking properly. So that four or five days after, I was feeling like, okay, let's give it another go because uh, I was just at that to get it. The thing is, I was just overconfident and uh, losing, losing lucidity. So next time I do it, everything's the same, just that third night where you have to push and keep, uh, keep focused. Yeah. So did you, did you try to sleep more before it got to the third night or, or like, what did you change specifically for that third night? So I did a, um, a very nice technique that I would say, which worked actually. I, I split it the night, the night into steps. Uh, I had about eight hours in the night to go through. So I didn't sleep more before I took a one hour nap, uh, before, which was uh, helpful at least already, but I broke it into small steps, eight 
eight big steps, which was ours, and uh, 12 small steps. The 12 small steps were five minutes. So the five minutes, I was checking my uh, my clock and doing, okay, one little step, two little steps, etc. until I had 12, and then I had one big step. And I was counting like that to make to make sure that I was making progress because uh, I didn't lose lucidity by really were, uh, counting the, the steps, the little steps and the big steps. Um, so, um, so that's, that's, that's really intense. That's like, yeah, I think that kind of, it kind of begs a different question of like how let's, let's say I was like, a someone that maybe didn't see why people would do this or like maybe think that it's just crazy. Right. Like it sounds like you're putting yourself just in such an extreme situation where mm -hmm. you're losing your mind. You're, you're in the wilderness still, right. You're, you're at risk per se and in, in different ways at risk. Right. Um, so why, why do it? Like why, why keep pushing and, and why put yourself back in that position three times? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I understand people why they are confused. Um, and me, this was a golden ticket. Really. It was really a golden ticket for me to, to get to the barking. Uh, um, yeah. I didn't have any choice, but to do that and to complete that because I was so, focused and so willing to do this race and i was so convinced that that would get me to the to the barclay that he had to get it done not not about getting the john muir fkt which is in the end uh was not as meaningful i was happy to to make uh to make this time and to give this reference to other people to to do it i was really happy about that but mostly to get my golden ticket, let's say. Uh, for the Barclays, there is only two golden tickets, one uh, in the Barclays Fall Classic and the other one at the Big Dog uh, Backyard. It's two race events that uh, Laz is uh, holding. But otherwise, there is nothing else. So to me, it was really the, the motivation. And uh, this is what kept me uh, kept me uh, doing that. Yeah. That's... <clears throat> it's really... like I can, I, I can totally understand, I feel like, the motivation right and you're just getting you get very fixated on the goal the mm -hmm. end result and and it's almost like there's there's no um there's no looking back essentially like you're just so committed that you don't question exactly. you don't even question it right um yeah. but I, I i imagine there's those people out there that are still just saying like like what's the point what i guess i yeah like like so i guess let me ask this a slightly different than what what value do you get from pushing your limits this far? Like, what do you take away? Like, what what's what's on the other side besides like the Barkley Marathon? Does has it changed you in any way? Does it give you like like does it change your perception of yourself? Like, yeah. what do you walk away from and just be like, this was totally worth it because this is on the other side. Yeah, yeah. so you know, I spend a, a lot of energy uh, and time and money into that. Uh, it's time consuming. It's uh, mental consuming also because you have to you think about it, you train about it, and and you you fail once, you fail twice, and uh, and people tell you, but why are you doing that? I mean, uh, this is something out of your league. You cannot do it, and this is just for ego and uh, just uh, have fun, just do it for hiking, and that's it. And. I'm like, yeah, but you know, it's not because I failed and because I spent uh, so much time doing that, that maybe sometime I will not succeed at it. You know, I will just give it another try and see if I can do it or not. And at some point you fail a lot of time, like in ultra running, you know, every race is cannot be perfect, but at some point, sometimes you succeed at it. Uh, like the Barclay and finisher are saying, so, you know, the bigger the challenge, the, the greater the, the reward. So once you finished and once you actually succeed, you feel like I did not do that for nothing. I actually believed in myself. I saw my weaknesses. I was able to address them. So that gives you a lot of pride and confidence thinking you can give you uh, big, uh, you can give yourself big goals in the life for, uh, for your job and whatever. And, and just think outside of the limits and just make the best effort to reach your goal and I think that's the point of uh, of such project, at least when you try one, two, three times and actually and finally succeed. I was feeling a lot of um, confidence, let's say, that even though I'm weak, I can address that by uh, spending more effort and uh, energy. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely resonate with that. Um, I think that, that life, like 
to me, goals are just such a massive part of life. And every time, mm-hmm. you know, you, you hit that next goal, whatever, whatever your goals are, you know, it allows you to, to see the world a little bit different and allows you to see yourself a little bit different and to, to continue progressing. Right. Which I think is, is, a a major focus of, of our life here is to, to continue to progress, um, in the different yeah, ways exactly. that we can. So, exactly. um, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's very well said the, the way that, that you said that there, um, going back to that night though, that, that's a really unique, um, approach to focusing your mind like that, right. To, to staying, you know, to counting your steps, small steps, big steps and, yeah. and staying clocked in like that. That's, that's very, um, unintuitive, I would say for a lot of people. I mean, do you, where did you come on to that kind of like, did you do, do you do meditation or like, where do you come on to, cause it seems like for you, this, the mental side of this is, is about yeah. as, as much as the physical side. Yeah. So to be honest, I, I didn't plan that. It was, it came just the third night when I, uh, I was thinking, yeah, you should do that. Otherwise you will not uh, succeed uh, again. I, I knew that I had to go through the night to succeed. Once the, the sun is up, everything will be, will be okay. I will stop the hallucination. I will, I will be okay. And I will be close to the finish. So I identified the time on the clock that I, I need to, to get. I didn't identify the summit. I didn't identify the valley or whatever. I identify really the time clock that I need to get. It was 5 a.m. if I remember. And from that, I just went backwards and asking me, okay, how much time do you have left? And how much closer to that time limit are you are you getting to? It's almost like you're getting to a summit, you know? To me, it was really the clock. So when I was like that, I was like, okay, now you keep focusing and you get closer to your goal, which is 5 a.m., by counting the little and the big steps. So I just decided that at the moment. And I was getting confidence that as the time progressed, I was getting closer to this, uh, to this goal. Because the year before, I was not looking at the time. I was looking at my, my dots on the track uh, and I was not seeing the progress. I was actually losing my mind because I was feeling like I was uh, going the opposite way and not making any progress. And it was confusing. Yeah. And with the numbers, it was easy. I was really, I knew really that the sun was coming up at five. So it was straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine. Um you know, being out there in your position and, and trying to, to stay focused like that. I mean, you see times like you can get on YouTube or different areas and you can watch, you know, runners run through the night, but they're never alone. Whereas you did all of this totally unsupported and you, you, you know, there's no one there to, to lead you through the night or to, yeah, to help yeah. you move forward or to make sure you're not getting off trail. And so, um, it might sound crazy, I think, sitting in a com- comfortable chair now, but like um, in the moment, like that's that's a very real scenario to be in and to, and to have to navigate for sure. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, the most difficult thing is not about uh, having a night, a full night like this. It was my third night. So I had to face a first night like this, then a second day, then a second night, then a third day, and then this third night. So um, it was about 70 hours in where I was really, really feeling sleepy. And, and I had hallucination again the third times where uh, I had the, the mountains uh, talking to me again and, uh, and the trail, which was the trail was a person. It was like a snake making it itself steeper and steeper just for me to fail. And I was angry about it. I was like, come on, man, uh, stop <laughs> being so steep and help me. So I was, you know, I was having some, some tough moments uh, where really the, the trail and the mountain were perf- personal, personal, it was, it was like a person, you know, I don't know how to say. Yeah. Uh, but because this was a third night in the first night, it was better. It was uh, a lot easier, let's say. Uh, so yeah, that changed things when you're 10, 20 hours or 70 hours into your thing. It's, uh, it's tough. <laughs> yeah. Do, do, did you ever have an experience with those hallucinations that were like frightening, like they scared you or like made you not want to continue down the trail or something because you see something ahead of you or were they not, no. not that kind of, no. Okay. <laughs> no, I had some, um, some trunks, some trees, sometimes I was feeling that there were bears, uh, from far away, you know, in the night, yeah. but, uh, just, uh, just, uh, the shape, you know, and I was not afraid when I, as I get closer, I, I was, oh no, it's a tree. So it's okay. But no, no, otherwise not much. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have a YouTube channel, uh, where you've documented this. Um, and I, I watched that film and I can't remember if it was in every attempt or a certain attempt, but 
it looked really cold and like the like oh, yeah. you were kind of struggling with with the temperature right and i believe you ran this was it in um august right august you ran was the the time frame or no it was always beginning of september within the two first september. week of september always yeah. Yeah. and it was okay. cold yeah. it was about freezing at night yeah. Yeah, those those big granite basins. I've I don't know if I've ever been more cold myself than being in some of those big big granite basins with lots of water, right? Yeah. And they're just it's like it's like a refrigerator in there. I swear yeah. they just get. And then there's wind. There's always wind. And yeah. um, was that a factor in every, every? Like, did you get better at dealing with the cold as it went on? Like in different Actually, attempts. Yeah, I got lucky the third time. I didn't know how to deal with it. The second time I did it, I, I had a, a cough. I had a very painful um, painful uh, yeah, illness because of the cold uh, at night. So I was coughing <laughs> a lot. Uh, and the third time, by chance or maybe by uh, preparation, I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, it, I didn't have any problem. Uh, but I think the cold actually helped me in the night to, to keep moving. Um, because if it was really warm and nice and um, maybe I would have laid on the floor and just sleep, you know, but that was not possible <laughs> at this temperature. I, I had no choice to, to keep moving. So, yeah. 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 So like, I was also surprised makes sense now as I was kind of looking at it, but when I, when I very first opened that video, you, you only had a small day pack essentially is what most people would call it like a running vest style pack. Right. So, maybe 10 liters of capacity or so. Um, but you don't yeah, have any kind of sleeping equipment. Like, like, so no. when you go to take a nap, you're just laying right on the dirt, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, I had a five liter capacity. Um, it was oh, a wow. Salomon Travest, you know, but mm -hmm. basically I didn't have anything inside. It just, uh, it was just uh, the food, the water. I just have one liter water. Um, and nothing else. I just had a pair of gloves and, uh, what else? Yeah. I didn't even have another layers, other socks, other anything else. Oh yeah. I had a rain jacket. Um, but that was it. So I didn't have much capacity and I was just going straight anyway from the start to the finish. So it was just about food and for food, I had also some, uh, some belts around me to put the food in to the food inside. Um, so yeah, I didn't need to carry much more. Yeah, that's, that's so little. I mean, essentially, when you do something like that, you're committing to not stopping, right? Because you can't stop, you don't have insulation and, and warmth, you know, provided if you stop. So you, you essentially, like you say, like through those nights, you're committed, you can't stop or you would, you would be freezing cold, right? So um, just mentioned nutrition. So what kind of nutrition, what did nutrition look like for you on the trail? You, you kind of mentioned some of the food items, but like, how many calories are you consuming in a day or did you track that? Yeah, it was um, 5,000 calories per day. It was 15,000 calories, I remember, for the full trip. Um, and actually, I think I ate uh, most of it. I think I ate about yeah, 13 to 14,000 calories. Um, it was about that. And yeah, it was mostly about, um, as I said, almonds, bacon, some uh, cereal, cereal bars, but not much. Uh, and then it was also some powder, uh, some powder to get into the, um, into the water and just drink, uh, to get some, it was a mix between maltodextrin and some protein or so, some whey protein, I believe. Um, so it was, yeah, it was about drinking and eating all those various stuff, some, uh, chocolate bars as well. Uh, well, yeah. Were you filtering your water or no? No, no, I didn't have any issue uh, with this. So, um, <laughs> so it was good. I never got sick. Yeah. Bye. I, uh, I interviewed, interviewed Josh Perry and he's, he said oh. an FKT as well, or a few of them. Yeah. And that, that surprised me probably more than anything else that he, I mean, at least on the John Muir trail, you're, you're in very, most of the time you've got very good water sources, right? Yes. 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 Um, but still, um, I think, I think I've gotten so paranoid about, about mm -hmm. it that actually on my ultra marathon, there was a point when I was having some hydration issues where I had like some drink mixes with electrolytes and, um, I had over, I'd essentially taken too many electrolytes on because I started cramping early on. So I had, I'd gone too many electrolytes and then I was passing these, these creeks of just crystal clear water high in the mountains and I wouldn't drink them with, cause I didn't have a filter. Oh, really? okay. And I, in, in retrospect, like looking backwards, I was like, that was so stupid. <laughs> you know, it's just so <laughs> stupid. Um, Anyways, oh, I, I find that interesting. 
you're, you're really bad lucky if you get sick into the mountain. At least it depends on water. You have to you have, you have to flow, and uh, usually it's okay. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I I should have. Yeah, I think I think you know. Good going back to that point though of like sitting here in this chair. That's a very easy decision for me to say. Oh, I like yeah. Why didn't I drink the water? What was I thinking? But when yeah, you're yeah. in that exhausted state, and maybe you haven't thought about that before, of your course. logic isn't the same, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, as you look back at these efforts, to you, what's the harder part of the equation? The physical part or the mental part? The, the mental part for me. Uh, it's very hard to, to focus your time into training and to preparing for that as unsupported uh, because you really need to think about everything. You really need to, to make sure that all your equipment uh, that you have is going to be used and that you're not going to need anything else. So this is really the mental preparation of being yourself uh, and then being uh, being yourself at the preparation and then being yourself out there uh, once you're uh, on the trail to keep uh, pushing, let's say, even though you're in the nature and you should have fun, it's not really fun anymore in the in the end if you're exhausted and etc. So despite everything, you have to keep your mental focus and that thing for me, this is uh, the ha- hardest part. Yeah. Yeah. So you make it through the third night, you finish the FKT, you set the record, which um, from what I'm seeing, it still stands today, correct? At least for no. the direction on the trail. Yeah, but the direction I took, I think is actually easier than the other direction. Is it less elevation gain or more? Yes, exactly. I did less okay. elevation gain than the other direction. So the FKT website, the way it is, you would think I have the FKT. Uh, but you, if you go on the next tab, you see that it's not the case. Uh, there is Joe and the, the, the latest one also. Um, I don't remember the name, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, There's no, you've got Jeff, Jeff Garmier oh, and exactly. Joe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So they're, they're man, those their two times are 13 minutes apart, and then yeah. you're just a little bit behind them too. I mean, but as far as, like, going a certain direction um, – you know, south and north, you you technically still have have it on the site, but um, exactly, exactly, that's incredible though. I mean, that stood for for a long time. It looks like um, yeah. until this summer, until this summer, yeah. yeah, both of them were this summer. Wow, within those those two, we did it within a month of each other. Wow, yeah, Joe, <laughs> Joe, would, uh, Joe was surprised. I think, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, so walk me through what it was like to finish. I mean, you, you finish that last day, you go, you, you essentially, you know, get to the trailhead or cross the line at the end. Um, like, what are, what are you feeling at that point? It was very sad, to be honest. <laughs> because <laughs> I think you can see in the video, uh, if you saw it until the, until the end, the, I was like, uh, now what? Uh, I'm by myself, nobody. And that's why I put also the sound on the video, like people congratulating yeah, <laughs> Yeah, it yeah. was just to make fun because it was like, for me, for me, it was big achievement. But there is nobody to to congratulate yeah. me, or and that's not the point. But that's really what you say. It's like I did it, and now, now what? <laughs> I didn't change the world. I didn't uh, make anything. I mean, it's just uh, just a thing, you know. And the now what was going to come several months after when I was applying to the Barclay again, as I said, and there was there was no. Uh, now what? Because I didn't uh, enter at the time. So I was like, well, you learn about it and you succeeded at something you you get yourself into. So it's good, but it was not about, uh, <laughs> you know, I get the FKT, I'm, uh, I'm strong, I'm the best. It was just there, yeah, but that's that's it. It's uh, it's done now <laughs> Now to the next project, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty interesting scenario, right? Like, like, you've i'm you've run ultra races right and so like yeah. you it, there like you go through the finish line people are yeah. cheering there's like all this and you just like get to this trailhead and people are just passing you have no idea what you just did exactly. you know they're just walking around in their own world of train of thoughts and you're <laughs> it was funny people way. were uh, i think some people were judging me they were like uh, i was really really dirty walking in a strange way <laughs> And uh, they were like, uh, "What is he doing?" <laughs> it's, and uh, well, I, I liked your I liked your somersault, your your roll, and then you just sat yeah, on the ground. Yeah, I think that's people are really looking at you. Then <laughs> that was my signature for some friends uh, back in France. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So tell me, I want to cover both the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. So you can start with whichever one you want to, but just what, like on the, on the trip, what was the highest of high and the lowest of low? The lowest was when I woke up at 4 a.m. on my second attempt where I was not able to work anymore. And when I was in the middle of the wilderness and uh, I had still 10 hours to go back to the road to which hike, um, I was really feeling low because I knew I didn't get the record and I knew I needed to to do 10 hours uh, just working very slowly just to each hike with uh, nobody. That was a very hard time. Uh, and I think that was the lowest for me. Um, and the highest uh, was really the, the last uh, 15 miles uh, where I saw my life, um, my last uh, year of work and energy and uh, training. And I knew it was going to happen and I knew I succeeded finally. So I was feeling a, a drain of adrenaline and of emotion. I never felt in my life. Achieving for me the impossible. Um, and I was really feeling this adrenaline all the way to the finish uh, for several hours. And it was kind of, um, I was transcending myself, myself and it was some emotion I never felt in my life. So I will always remember some emotion. I always, um, I also felt in some other races uh, and it was amazing to, to overcome, uh, to feel a lot of pain when you're struggling and finally overcome those pains to finally succeed, let's say. So it was all the emotion and this was the high feeling for me. Yeah. Yeah. Both of those sound like some pretty highs and some pretty lows for sure. Um, (laughs) and, and I mean, this is just what a journey, I guess, to, to go back three different attempts, get that far on each of those attempts. Cause I think, I think when I think like when I first was thinking attempts, I'm thinking like you started off day one, you weren't feeling it. So you just get off trail like day one. Right. But you were so, I mean, 60 and 80 hours in, into these, um, efforts, they're, they're, uh, it's, it's really quite amazing. Um, yeah, I really tried all the way. And uh, I, I discovered really close to the finish every time that uh, it was not going to happen. But some, some people had some, some issues in the first day or two, switching, uh, to, um, having some ankle uh, issue and, and, and such. I, I didn't have that. So I was lucky to, to at least move for at least two to three days. And eventually, yeah, eventually I failed. But at least I was happy to, to, to move in. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, did you, was it fun? Did you have fun on the trail or was it, was it just, no, no, it was (laughs) great. (laughs) Did you like, did you like the trail? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So so, by night it was strange because by night you cannot see much, but the journey trail is amazing. Uh, so there is some people, uh, telling me at the time, why are you doing that in three days? I mean, uh, you should take 20 days to do it and you should enjoy. And, um, and I agree with them. This, this trail is just really beautiful. Um, but I didn't have 20 days. Um, I didn't have enough vacation. I was working and I wanted to spend some time in France as well. So I was really feeling um, privileged uh, and lucky and, and happy to, to see the trail at daytime, of, of course. Yeah. Even if it was a short time, because this is really a beautiful place. This is amazing. You're really into the wilderness and you're feeling by yourself over there. Um, there is no roads anywhere, uh, no mountain huts, only one uh, at the middle. Uh, but it was amazing to see that. So I had a lot of fun seeing the nature. And then about the, um, the sport aspect, let's say the ultra aspect, I had a lot of fun discovering uh, my limits. So um, it was amazing. And, and some people doesn't understand because... Why doing the John Muir Trail in three days? Um, the answer I, I give them most of the time is, is better than is better in three days than uh, not at all. Um, because I was never going to do it otherwise. Uh, well, I was never going to spend 20 days as some people do um, because um, I didn't feel the, um, how to say, the confidence or the that I would be brave enough to really hike for so long. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was a point. It was better than nothing for me. <laughs> I really like I really like the way that you said that that it's better in three days than than not at all. Um, yeah, I would agree. I think that's I think that's a great perspective on that. So you're entering into the Barkley Marathon. Is there anything else that's kind of next for you? Um, like, what have you been doing since since the completion? Have you been running ultras, or do you just trail run on your own time? Or 
Yeah, I've been running at Ultras, um, not as successful. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not really in the competition. Uh, I like to push my limits. Uh, one of the big things I did, it was uh, two years ago now, was to cross the Pyrenees. Um, it was kind of a journey trail, but for 12 days instead of three. <laughs> 12 so, days? Yeah, it was uh, 550 miles across uh, the Pyrenees, so, the South uh, French mountains. Okay. Um, and, yeah. Uh, so, well, I was, I was going to have you tell us where that is, but so South, <laughs> South France mountains, um, 12 days, 500 miles, right? Yes, a little bit more, yeah, but uh, it was painful, yeah. So I was sleeping for 12 days, of course, but I was sleeping only three hours a day. Um, I was self-supported for this as well. Um, it was kind of is the this a hut to hut. Is this a hut to hut type hike? I know that in Europe, that's more of what what's available, right? Kind of, but I was not really sleeping in hut. I was really sleeping on the floor again. I had a, <laughs> I had a mattress at this time. I had a mattress and a sleeping bag, uh, so I could sleep. Okay. Uh, but it was not really comfortable again. It was just to be able to get some sleep and just get moving. Um, so and it was something. It was something very similar to the John Mill Trail, but for uh, four times longer, and uh, with more sleep, with only three hours of sleep and with a mattress. But otherwise, the style was really, really similar. It was the same. It was I was really light, uh, not bringing much except my food uh, and my mattress, and uh, that was about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, is this a pretty popular trail in France? Yeah, 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 there is um, many people doing that in the summer. Uh, usually, they take um, about yeah two months. Uh, yeah, about two months is uh, the right uh, time to, to do it because it's long. It's uh, as I said, it's five hundred fifty miles. So, um, but yeah, are you going really like are you going through cities or is it mainly in the mountains the entire way? It's mostly in the mountains. Yeah, mostly in the mountains, and people are as you said they're sleeping in huts uh, and seeing other people, other hikers. It's almost like the Pacific Crest Trail, I would say, but shorter. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's but really the Pacific Crest Trail is uh, is in the um, in the city sometimes. It's it's kind of a yeah in between Pacific Crest Trail and John Muir Trail. It's something in between. Okay. So you're living in France now, or you, you were born yeah. in France as well? Okay. Yeah. Um, um, so tell us, years, yeah. tell us a little bit about what it's like to you know be an outdoors enthusiast in France. Like what is. Um, like, I'm just kind of curious, like, I just, I just barely got back from Germany and Austria. And obviously I was, I was trying to learn as much as I could about the outdoors and, and what people are doing in the outdoors there. Um, but obviously in the United States, we have massive amounts of, of public land, right? Which is yeah. kind of allows us to, to have different experiences than many other countries, right? So what's it like in France uh, as far as like what's available and what do, what do many people do? And is there things that people should come to France to do? Yeah, it's difficult to say. Um, the Pyrenees, I like the best. It's just one hour, 30 minutes away from where I live. And I spend every me every weekend over there. And there is always uh, <laughs> different places I can see that I didn't see uh, before. Uh, so it's very nice playground. Uh, there is the Alps also in terms of mountains. Um, I really like mountains, so I'm going to talk only about mountains. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. The Pyrenees is amazing and it's um, it's very particular. It's not something like you will see elsewhere. It's not like the Grand Canyon or like Yosemite or anything you could find in the US. It has its proper style with a lot of lakes and trees and mountains and peaks and and it's big. So it's a, it's a huge playground that I'm happy to, to now live uh, nearby. But otherwise, um, the outdoor culture, uh, let's say, it's pretty strong. We are using different equipment because we don't have the same brand and same uh, distributors, but it's pretty similar. I would say I have the, the I see the same passion in the French people than I had in the U S also, um, respect, respecting the nature and etc. and enjoying the nature. So I would say it's pretty similar in this uh, aspect. Are people, are people, um, like sleeping outdoors for like, like, like you mentioned, you had a sleeping bag and a pad, but many mm -hmm. people are going to like hut to hut. So are they still taking a sleeping bag and a pad and they just don't need a shelter or, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, like in here, it's like everyone has a shelter and their sleeping yeah. system and all these things. Like what changes gear wise, you know, or, or, or are you able to backpack the same way that way as far as more terms of backpacking? 
Yeah, I see. Um, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not really an expert in uh, backpacking, let's say, because I don't do that often. Uh, there is people using tents and etc., cetera, um, boiler and, and such. Uh, but I'm more a fast hiker, uh, let's say, really, uh, as you saw, just get moving and uh, and going back to the car, let's say, or just finishing the trail. And uh, so I'm more into that um, because I don't like to get heavy and to carry a lot of stuff. I just like to get the, the minimum I need uh, to just get fast and, um, and do uh, as much as I can within some time limits, let's say. Uh, but also, why there is a lot of people uh, doing um, backpacking and um, with a, a lot of uh, tools and etc. But I'm not an expert in, the, in this, so I, I could not compare, to be honest. Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, it's really interesting. I, I got to to go and see at least some of the Alps in Austria, and um, yeah, they're they're very unique, very different, and yeah. there's a lot of a lot of areas internationally that I'd love to be able to go and see an experience for sure over time so um well i really appreciate it um it's been really insightful to just learn more about your fkt i think that's such a phenomenal thing uh that you did obviously you held the record for five years and um it's really really phenomenal it's it's, it's so interesting to me to just kind of get inside of your head to experience some of that with you um to to learn, you know, these crazy things such as the hallucinations you're having and, and the challenges that can that can come up when you are pushing your limits. But um, I appreciate you sharing about you pushing your limits and what you learned and, and, you know, what you're able to take away from all that. And I also hope that you get into that Barkley Marathon. Um, that'd be phenomenal. I'll, uh, I'll have to watch for that. And, uh, you know, if, if you ever do get in it, it'd be fun to hear how that effort goes for you. So. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. um, crossing fingers. It will, um, it will happen, and uh, it will go well. At least I'm still working on that. It's my uh, lifetime uh, project, let's say, and uh, something uh, I'm really into it. So yeah, let's see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. I'm gonna go ahead and let you go. I really appreciate all your time today. Thank you very much, Jason. All right, there you have it. That was a fantastic interview. I really enjoyed my time uh, with Aurelian. He's he's a character. He's got a lot of insight. And just talk about a guy who's out there pushing his limits. I think that at times we get pretty focused on on staying in our own lanes, right? Like doing our thing. And, and maybe even sometimes we even criticize people who are pushing their limits to extremes that we're not personally comfortable with. Or maybe we don't see the big advantage of completing. But I think it's phenomenal that he's out there chasing his dreams and completing them, setting goals and accomplishing them. I hope, I hope that when you guys listen to a podcast like this, you're doing the same thing. You're setting your sights on your goals. Maybe it's not FKTs. Maybe it's not anything, you know, a goal can be anything, right? But I hope that you're setting your goals and you're allowing that to push you in your life. And speaking of that, I just wanted you to know that in 2023, we will be rolling out the 100 mile challenge again here at Outdoor Vitals. Um, I'm really excited about this because we've changed it so there can actually be two different ways to complete this, Uh, but I'm not going to give away the teasers, but I think that there'll be a little bit more of a place for more people to take part in this challenge next year to set a big goal and go accomplish it. It was so fun to hear all of the feedback from last year. I'm very excited to roll that forward for next year, but Um, I hope you guys really enjoyed this podcast. And if you did, please go leave us a rating, a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. We really, really do appreciate them. And here shortly, I'll also be recording an episode which is just dedicated to questions and comments. So if you're watching on YouTube and you leave a comment there, um, I'll be answering some of those as well as going through reviews and making sure that we answer any questions or comments that we have there. So if you want your question answered on the podcast, um, please go leave us a review and ask the question in the review. That works too. Or jump over to YouTube and leave us a comment there. Or you can also reach out to liveultralightpodcast at gmail.com. Um, Thanks for tuning in, guys. Make sure you are subscribed. We've got more awesome episodes and podcasts to come. We'll catch you on a future one.